Hi, I'm David Hartman on a very windy day in New York. Uh, maybe you joined Barry Lewis and me recently when we did a walking tour of 42nd Street from the East River to the Hudson. Well, here we go again, except this time we're going to cover a lot more ground. I am standing at the southern tip of Manhattan in New York City. This is where the most famous street in the world began uh, and begins. It's Broadway, of course, uh, that pounds its way north to the Harlem River and beyond. Broadway is the light and the life of New York, the biggest blend of humanity in the world. Uh, from the Native Americans who were here first, from the Dutch, the British, and now Americans of all colors, all cultures, languages, and religions, all making our New York the most extraordinary city in the world. Celebrate it with us. Our tour guide is an absolute joy at bringing New York alive. Barry Lewis, architecture historian trained at Berkeley in the Sorbonne. He teaches at the New York School of Interior Design and the Cooper Union Forum, and most days guides walking tours all over New York. Join Barry and me for a walk up Broadway. And our Broadway maestro, of course, is Barry Lewis. Barry, how are you? How you doing, David? Right, I'm ready. 17 miles? Ready? OK. Let's do it. All right. You said that Broadway developed in jumps. What did you mean? Oh, absolutely. Now, the, the first 200 years of this city's existence, Broadway really meant nothing. It was the American Indians that blazed the trail. The Dutch took it over from them. The English took it over from the Dutch. When the English had it, well, let me show you something. I have a great map of the whole route. Look at that. Now, this is the whole route we're going to do. Right. We're down here at Bowling Green. Mm -hmm. When the English had this place, Broadway ran from Bowling Green past the English Commons. We were in English City. Every English city has a Commons. We call it today City Hall Park. Ran past the Commons, skirted north of that. It skirted the African burial ground, which we're going to see. And then it ran straight into a, a, a swamp that ran across the middle of Manhattan. In New York City, a swamp? Ugh, pestilential, malodorous, you know, <laughs> a lot of people think New York is still a swamp. Uh, and, you know, it just, it just ended. Right. It was nothing. Well, by the beginning of the 19th century, that changes. Let me show you. Here. It's just after 1800, and look at that. There's Lower Broadway. These are the finest houses in the city. This was the best address, like Fifth Avenue, opposite Central Park today. There's Bowling Green. And way uptown is the spire of Trinity right, Church. So if everybody lived here, where was the business going on? The center of the city, downtown, midtown, the shops, retailing, banking, was by the East River. The whole city faced the East River. This was the back end of the city. OK, Bowling Green, though, going back to when the Native Americans were here, and then the Dutch took over. How did Bowling Green develop? What well, happened? when the Native Americans had the place, where the Custom House is now, that was their trading spot. The Dutch built a fort on it. It was a joke of a fort. It belonged on the Comedy Channel. And in front of it was a big open space. And this is where they had their markets, their parades. They hung out. They did their bowling. They did their fighting. You know, it was New York. They needed a pastime. <laughs> well, the English, right. by the 1730s, they made it a park. And then around 1770, the colonists put up a big statue of George III. Now, that was thank you for repealing the Stamp Act. Absolutely. Right? We thought he knew what he was doing, but European monarchs, they didn't know how to deal with Americans. And we knew that by 1776. On July 9th of that year, up in the Commons, they read the Declaration of Independence. Then they all come running down Broadway, and they're hooting, and they're hollering, and they're carrying on, which New Yorkers do very well. And they rip down the statue of George III, and they swear they're going to send it to Litchfield, Connecticut, and turn it into musket balls, which they did. Right. And then, come here, David, I want to show you something. Well, this fence had been put up in 1771. It came from this, England. This fence? Yeah, it's one of the oldest artifacts left in Manhattan Island. Now, it's an English fence. On every one of the posts, it had a royalist symbol. Might have been a crown, might have been globes. We don't know. And it was put up to protect George. You'd think they want to rip the thing down. Well, it may have been a revolution, but we didn't want to get carried away. You know, we're not French. So they went around and, I don't know, twisted off, sawed off, but they ripped off the royalist symbols and kept a perfectly good, practically brand new So this is fence. that fence? Absolutely. And as a matter of fact, 
If you put your hand up there, you can feel the roughness of the metal. Yeah, you really can. Yeah, they never had time to come back and file it down. Uh, you know, fighting a revolution, it's a 25-hour-a-day job. Now for the custom house. It is this so substantial. is a palace. And a, a magnificent, one of the best buildings in New York City. This went up in the early 1900s. Cass Gilbert did it, who later on did the Woolworth building. And it was a magnificent place for doing business with the customs people. And out front, the four statues of the continents in politically incorrect order today. On the far left is Asia, autocratic. On the far right, sleeping Africa. In the center of the complex, you have Europe on the right, monarchial and stiff back, and there's America. She's the only dynamic statue in the group. It's as compelling in here as it is outside. Isn't it magnificent? It's one of New York's great interiors. It's interesting how the architecture leads us up the stairs and into this main rotunda, which was the main business room of the custom house. This is where all of the agents were, behind this wonderful oval marble counter. Now, you did your business with them. After you finished your business, you went over to the cashier's office, all bronze teller cages and marble counters to divvy up what you own. We didn't have income tax until 1916, so how important was this building to the federal well, government? This is why the Fed spent so, so much money on this building. You know, there was no income tax, so they, they relied on customs duties. New York's port was so huge that we collected twice as much as all the other ports put together. These murals, when were they done? About 20 years after the building was built, the WPA program had Reginald Marsh, one of the great painters of the 1930s, do these murals of ships coming into New York the most famous, though, is that one up there. Some people say it's Greta Garbo. Some say it's Jean Harlow giving a press conference on a ship. All right, the chief, the boss of this place, had to have an office, right? He did pretty well. That office is modeled on one of the great chambers in the Doge's Palace in Venice. Louis Comfort Tiffany did the woodwork. The fireplace is magnificent, puffered ceiling. Isn't it fascinating how that era dealt with the public? I mean, think of all the great buildings that we built in that era. And of course now, this is the Smithsonian uh, Museum of the American Indian. And it's appropriate. After all, this site was originally Indian trading ground. The road we're going up Broadway was originally an Algonquin trail. Uh, this museum has the largest collection of Native American artifacts in the world. Did this thing come from? Well, the artist who did this dropped it one night in front of the stock exchange, right after the last stock market crash, as a kind of symbol of hope. I don't think the city agreed with him, and they moved it down here, and they're still fighting over the future of this statue. But it has gotten so popular. Every tourist in New York comes down here and takes a photograph of this. Just turn around, look at this fabulous building. Behind those three arches is a magnificent 60-foot-high ticket hall for the Cunard Line. These were the great steamships that took you to Europe. Remember, in those days, there were no jet planes. You had to take a ship to go to Europe. And the Cunard people wanted the fantasy of the trip to begin the moment you bought a ticket. So they built this magnificent ticket hall. The scale is of the Roman baths. The decoration is of the Renaissance. Ezra Winter did the murals. Ten years later, he did the lobby of Radio City Music Hall. Barry Faulkner did 15-foot-high maps of the world. Samuel Yellen from Philadelphia did a magnificent iron screen that runs across the front of it. And they also gave you a first-class lounge that still exists. Remember, when the Titanic sunk, the survivors were picked up by the Carpathia, and that was a Cunard ship. We've only walked a few blocks, but we've gone the whole length of New Amsterdam. We're here at Broadway and Wall Street. By the way, underneath us is the Wall Street subway station, and they just restored the original token booth. It's beautiful. Now, Wall Street, was there ever really a wall? Of course. Hey, they didn't fool around about names. Look at this. The Dutch did this map in the 1650s of New Amsterdam. Now, there's the fort, mm -hmm. which eventually this is, that's where the Custom House went, the Museum of the American Indian. We started down here at Bowling Green, 
walked up the Broadway. It was the broadest street in the city. For the Dutch, that ended at the wall. Now, the wall went from river to river. The purpose, entire width. Purpose? Well, it was more to keep out. It, we think it was to keep out the American Indians. No, it was actually to keep out the English from Connecticut. OK, so when the English took over, what did they do? Well, they ripped down the wall. They extended Broadway north. And right here, they built their mother Anglican church, the church that is standing in back of us, Trinity Church. This is brownstone? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of course, this is the third church on the site. But when they built this in 1846, they wanted it to have, well, you know those Gothic churches in Europe. They have that wonderful patina of age. Well, that's what we wanted, but hey, we're American. Right. So they built it out of brownstone to give it that mellow, old look. And for the next 40 years, New York was covered with brownstone. But what is most fascinating in this cemetery is the oldest artifact on Broadway. It's the grave of a five-year-old boy who died in 1664. Ticker tape parades right up Broadway here. We honor our heroes that way, sports teams, astronauts, world leaders. 1886, dedication of the Statue of Liberty, first parade up the canyon of heroes. How exciting does it get, Lewis? Well, what I'd like to know is who cleans up all that stuff? You are such a romantic. You really are. David, somebody has to be the realist in this outfit. Yeah, right. OK, Park Row, what was here? David, this was the road out of New York City. Not Broadway. Broadway ended in a marsh. If you wanted to go to Boston and points north, you came up Park Row, up the Bowery, and you were off to Boston. By the late 18th century, here's where the first theater settled. By the middle of the 19th century, this was Newspaper Row, which is like saying this is the Hollywood of America of the 19th century. There was no other medium but the newspapers. You had all of them lined up along here. You had the Tribune, the Herald, the Times, the World, uh, the Journal. They all were here. Anything that happened in New York, for good or for bad, everybody in America knew about it the next day. And the reporters and the, the publishers of these newspapers were as famous in their time as actors and directors today. If Steven Spielberg had lived back in the 19th century, he'd be a writer in one of these buildings and just as famous. All right, now coming around here, City Hall, now? Well, remember, it used to be the Commons. Right. By the 1800s, we needed a new City Hall. And in 1812, they opened it up here in the Commons. They never thought anybody would be living north of City Hall. They couldn't imagine what New York City would look like in 50 years. Right. You know, underneath that City Hall, is the 1904 City Hall Station from the original subway line. It's closed to the public today, but it's one of the most magnificent stations in the system. It is beautiful. What about this block? Well, look at this picture. This is about the turn of the 20th century. That is Astor House, which ran along the entire block. It was opened in 1836. It was the first modern business person's hotel here in New York City. All these big conference hotels and business hotels we have today, this is the granddaddy of them all. Now, right next to it, St. Paul's, still standing, just as it was in 1765 when it was built, facing the Hudson River, made out of Manhattan schist, which is the bedrock of Manhattan Island, which is how all the skyscrapers stand up. And think about it, after the revolution, when George Washington was inaugurated as president. Right down the street. Right down here on Wall Street. Now remember, Trinity had burned down during the revolution. So they came here for their service after the inauguration. You wonder what they were thinking when they were praying in this church. We were an experiment. And really, nobody knew if we were going to make it. The Woolworth Building went up in 1913, the tallest building in the world, 800 feet. Not as tall as the Eiffel Tower, but it was, it was the tallest real building in the world. 
Now, this building, it's not just that it was the tallest. It really sets the tone for the 20th century skyscraper. Oh. First of all, it rejoices in its verticality. It loves being a vertical building. And the neo-Gothic style makes it look even taller than it was. Before this, every building tried to look smaller than it was. And then, even though there was no zoning in those days, and buildings went up like those buildings on Thames Street, straight up, darkening the streets. In other words, with no setbacks? None whatsoever. Yeah. You could do what you want. It was like Houston and in those days. And here is a building that sets back to a narrow tower, thus giving the city the idea for the first zoning code only a few years later. And on top of that, it's not just an office building. It's a city within a building. The entire city within a building wrapped in a beautiful skin of terracotta. the Episcopal Bishop of New York who dubbed this the Cathedral of Commerce, but you do have that feeling when you walk in the lobby, at least I did, of, of being in a cathedral. Well, it was ironic the bishop said that because for Cass Gilbert, the architect of the building, this lobby was the town square for this great city within a building. And he was so American, he designed this so it was functional and efficient and worked well. And then he framed it in this magnificent two-story high space that we're sitting in. And the most magnificent vaulted ceiling of glass mosaics, probably inlaid by immigrant craftsmen, mostly Italian, who were paid very little, which is why they could do it then. And we can't do it today. Now. What draws people into this building, what they love, and this is what I love about this era, they could laugh in those days with the building. They could have fun. There are corbels throughout the lobby. Corbel? Well, a corbel is actually a bracket. Can't leave it out from the wall to hold the floor beam. But frankly, in here, everything's a stage set. Well, these corbels have carved figures of the various men who created this building. And right beneath us, there is Cass Gilbert, the architect, cradling a model of the Woolworth Building in his arms. And across the way is his patron, F.W. Woolworth, counting his nickels and dimes. A.T. Stewart, who was this guy? David, this is the man who invented the American department store and arguably the first department store in the world. This man came over from Northern Ireland with not a sou in his pocket. Comes here, and in fact, he was so poor when he opened his first business, he had to live above the shop. By the time he died, he was so wealthy, he built the first French chateau on Fifth Avenue up at 34th Street. How did he do it? He realized, how did people shop in those days? As they did in the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages, you went to little specialty stores to get whatever you needed. Stuart came up with the idea of taking all these little shops and putting in them in one building and calling it a department store. But nobody knew what that was. So in his ads, he had to say, well, this is like an oriental bazaar under one roof. And then he had the merchandising genius what is a department store? It's just a warehouse. But instead, he wrapped it in a five-story exterior of marble. Remember, this was a little red brick city. This five-story marble palace made it look like a Medici palace from Florence. So when his customers came to shop, they thought of themselves as Medici and would spend their money like Medici. And it worked. Worked so well that he began from here at Chambers and Broadway, where he opened the store in 1846, he started the march of the great department stores all the way up Broadway to the Ladies' Mile. And in fact, he had to open a second store in 1860 up at Broadway and 10th Street. Here you see, on the upper floors of the stores, he had workshops with hundreds of women sewing for the private customers that he had. And then look at this. This is, this is so American. You know, in Europe, the palace is a fixed idea. Once you build it, no. it's built. It's that palace forever. But Stuart understood, forever in the modern world, that lasts about five years. So the original Stuart's palace only went nine windows down from Broadway. But five years after he built it, he took the static European palace architecture and he turned it into this flexible, modular, expandable building. And what are they doing now? Well, 
Finally, after years of neglect, the city is restoring this building, both the exterior and interior, and when that scaffolding comes down, this building will be one of the great landmarks of New York City. Now we're a couple of blocks north of the Old Common, City Hall Park, and here we are at the edge of the African burial ground. All right, this African burial ground is right here on Duane Street, and we're going down there now. Dr. Cheryl Wilson is joining us. She is a PhD in urban anthropology and one of the directors of the African burial ground project. What, what was this cemetery and when? During the 18th century, the mid, seven, mid possibly early uh, 1700s, this was the designated site for Africans to be buried, both enslaved and free in New York City. When was this burial ground discovered and how? The burial ground was rediscovered in 1991 when the U.S. General Services Administration was preparing the site to place a new federal office building here. We estimate as many as 20,000 are buried here. In terms of the remains that you found, what kind of remains were found and what have you learned from those? We've learned that Africans were essential to the building of early New York. They were brought here to do the hard and dirty work of building early New York. Among the adults, the men and the women, the Africans were literally worked to death. For example, uh, many of the men had injuries to the, the base of the neck and the spine as a result of having to carry objects that might have weighed two to 300 pounds. Dr. Wilson, these photographs, for instance, the photographs of the beads, what significance does that have? Well, these are rare beads for the period, and they're certainly rare as possessions among Africans. Um, for me, they really tell the story of this possibly 40 to 50 year old woman who was buried here with the beads. She was the only one buried with possessions of this value. We have learned that in Africa during the same period that only people of royal families were allowed to possess these beads. And this certainly leads us to think that this woman uh, was of royal heritage, perhaps kidnapped or sold directly into slavery and somehow wound up here in, in North America. But would have brought this with her when she was kidnapped, perhaps, she probably had these yes, in her hand. Perhaps. And these remains, I'm just curious now, this is exactly? Of the African burial ground population, which was 427 individuals excavated from this site, this is our only example of a multiple burial in the same coffin. And we didn't know this initially. Initially, uh, we just thought this was an adult woman in her late 20s. Uh, she was known to us as burial number 335. Well, as the excavators proceeded, they learned that there was a second individual in the same coffin, and that was a newborn infant, which we hope to determine using DNA analysis whether this is her child or not. But the young, the baby is known to us as burial number 356. So she was buried with the baby cradled in her arm? Yes. Describe where we are. We are at the corner of Chaos and Mayhem, otherwise known as Canal and Broadway. It certainly has changed since the 18th century. Remember, this was the marshland, the Lisbonard Meadows, that stopped Broadway from moving northward. By 1810, we drained the marshes, we drained the uh, collect pond at Foley Square where the courthouses are, right. built a drainage canal along here, which is why we call it Canal Street, and rammed Broadway North on its way uptown. Now, in that period, in the 1810s and 20s, this was a middle-class residential district, wonderful quiet district. Look in the distance on the north side of Canal Street. Yeah. You see a whole slew of little Federalist houses. You can even see a dormer window, yep. so you know it's a house. That only lasted 30 years. What about the ethnic mix of cultures all around? Well, the Italians and the Jews, for the most part, have left. And the Chinese, who have been pouring into the city these last 25 years, they have spilled over Canal Street into Little Italy, east of the Bowery, into the Jewish Lower East Side. And this is only one of three Chinatowns now. Uh, oh, 
We've come about three blocks north of Canal Street. We're now at Broadway and Broom Street. And this building also looks Italian, at least to me. Is yes, it? David, but Italian from Venice. You see, A.T. Stewart's downtown, well, it was modeled on the Florentine Palazzi. Well, Florence was always at war. They had to practically live in a fortress. But Venice, Venice was an island city. It never got invaded. So they had beautiful open palaces, the perfect model for a mid-19th century department store, which is exactly what this was. Right, what's this made of? It's all cast iron ordered out of a catalog, just like we order blue jeans today from a catalog. Now, this is the cover of D.D. Badger's catalog and the actual cast iron foundry that created this building. It was right over there on the East River. And you just flipped through it until you found yourself a design you liked. And you got to a page and you said, you know, I like that. I'm ordering it. And in four or five days' time, hundreds of cast iron parts were shipped to you. Director set? I mean, really? Exactly like a director set. And it was all bolted together. And then it was painted to look like stone. As a matter of fact, sometimes they would marbleize it with faux marble veining so you would think it was marble. We're a few more blocks uptown, just north of Bleecker Street on Broadway. What are we going to find here? We're going to find the beginning of Bohemia. David, every beatnik, every hippie, every punk should know the address, 653 Broadway. Early village? Early East Village, early East East Village, <laughs> early Lower East Side of today. Right. Because this was where Charlie Pfaff, a Swiss German, opened his beer hall in the late 1850s. And I don't know how he managed to do this, but he drew in all of, all of the Bohemians, all of the avant-garde crazies of that day to Pfaff Saloon. And it became famous. Now, this is what Broadway would have looked like. This happens to be Broadway from Duane Street south of Trinity, but it, this, this part of Broadway would have been the same. All these elegant people, remember in the 1850s, this was the most elegant shopping street like 57th Street is today. And little did they know what was going on underneath this sidewalk as they walked along. This is an ad from Pabst, which actually appeared in the New York Saturday Press, which was to the 1850s, what the Village Voice was to New York of the 1950s. And then, by the 1870s, already the Pfaff's building has changed. It might be the same building remodeled. It might be a new building. But it could very likely be that these buildings, these newer buildings, incorporated the underground vaults where Pfaff's was located, which means that right here, right under this sidewalk, is where Walt Whitman and his bohemian friends hung out. We're standing in the sub-basement, two floors below that sidewalk where we stood just a moment ago. What do you see here, Barry? Well, David, you see those cast iron columns that are supporting the sidewalk? They're mid-19th century cast iron columns. You ordered them from D.D. Badger's or the other iron foundries. These vaults right under the Broadway sidewalk could very well be the vaults that Pfaff's was located in back So it would be on this floor right above us? Absolutely. The basement floor right under the sidewalk. Hmm. Look at this, this print. This, this is a cartoon showing all the characters hanging out at Pfaff's right under the sidewalk vault with all of Broadway walking overhead. And that would have been on the floor right Yes, here. it would have been right up there. And what characters they were. I mean, there was, uh, let's see, there was Ada Clare, who was known more for her lifestyle than for her art, which is, uh, that's a New York métier these days. Uh, she, in fact, had a love child. And instead of being ashamed about it, she would enter hotels and sign in as Miss Ada Clare and son. Then there was um, Jacob Ray Mould. I'm sure he used to hang out here brilliant designer. He helped to design the architectural elements in Central Park. He was so wild and crazy. He was a flamboyant gay guy. By the 1880s, he had to leave New York because who knows how many creditors and boyfriends were after him. And also many great writers. William Dean Howells, the great critic and editor and novelist, and certainly Walt Whitman, who's mm -hmm. from Brooklyn. In fact, during the time when he would hang out at Fass, he wrote the poem Crossing Brooklyn Ferry because he crossed over to Manhattan frequently. He wrote Leaves of Grass, and he wrote this about Fass. He wrote the vault of Fass where the drinkers and laughers meet to eat and drink and carouse, while on the walk immediately overhead past the myriad feet of Broadway. Looking back down Broadway from here, it is just magnificent, and the Woolworth Building, 
but it's obvious also there's a significant bend in the road here. How did that come about? This is where Broadway starts its climb to the Upper West Side, Washington Heights, and Albany. And we're going to be up in Washington Heights soon. All right, but how did this happen? Well, Who legend what? has it. Look at this little print. This was Henry Brevoort's estate back in the early 19th century. He sold part of his estate to Grace Church so they could build there. And legend has it, this was his favorite tree that he liked to smoke his pipe under, and he didn't want his favorite tree destroyed. But th that's a myth. All right, what's the truth? Well, the, it's more mundane. The truth was, when the commissioners laid out the streets of New York in 1811, they decided to bend Broadway so it would meet the Bowery and the Bloomingdale Road at Union Square. So here's Grace Church. We've come up three or four blocks. Right. We're here in Union Square. Now, before the Civil War, quiet residential elegance. Not for long. After the war, the Civil War, up come the theaters, up come the shops. Look. Right here on 14th Street, the theaters. This was the theater district. Remember, hello, Dolly? Dolly Levi comes to Harmonia Gardens on 14th Street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, this was the area. Now, it shows you, if you look at the map again, this is, ah, this is our Bedecker. Now, we started down here. Broadway ran straight up to 11th Street. And there's the bend. And, absolutely. And at 11th Street, it bends so that here, the Bowery, Broadway, and the Bloomingdale Road were united here at Union Place. Union Square, it has nothing to do with labor unions or the Civil War. And this is really where Broadway begins its uptown journey. And Union Square has seen many different kind of many. lives, but now it's absolutely fabulous. And of course, the green market here is the best one in New York. Why is this market so significant and how did it get here and get this way? Well, to me, this is an oasis in the city and it's better in many ways than Central Park, especially if you're interested in food. It started here in 1976. Before that, this was just a drug-infested area, the whole place. And it's a combination of chefs wanting wonderful things that are local. So they have people from Long Island and New Jersey and Pennsylvania and upstate New York. And upstate New York, the Hudson Valley, which used to be the breadbasket, of New York City and fell on hard times is once again something like that because there are so many farmers there who bring their things down here. So we're at 17th and Broadway, north end of Union Square. In the 19th and early 20th century, New York was divided between downtown, which is where the money was made, and that's where the corporations were, the banks, and it was strictly a male preserve. And then there was Midtown. Midtown was where the money was spent, and that was the ladies' preserve. This is dead center of Ladies' Mile, right here at Broadway and 20th Street, right across the street from the 1869 Lord and Taylor's Department Sam and George. In those years, in the 1870s and 80s, money flowed down this part of Broadway. This was the wealthiest part of town, at least for shopping. Lord and Taylor had plenty of company. Arnold Constable was down the street. Tiffany's was nearby, W and J Sloan. Brooks Brothers was up at 22nd Street. This is where you came to buy the goods that will allow a New Yorker to do what they like to do best. Which was? make you choke on how much money they have. And these were the stores to do it. All of these department stores had magnificent interior atriums, glass skylights, balconies surrounding them, grand stairs, because the moment you got the clothing, you went home, put it on your back, and you came back to the department store. It was like the opera house, but during the day, you strolled through that department store and you showed everybody every jewel and every diamond you owned. You shopped to buy clothes to shop. Absolutely. Now, not everybody, you know, was, was happy when these stores opened up. This had been a beautiful, quiet, residential neighborhood right down the street with the Roosevelts, the Teddy Roosevelt Sr. family. When this store opened up in 1870, Teddy Roosevelt Sr. said to his brood, which, by the way, included the future president, he said, that's it, this neighborhood is shot, it's finished, and he pulled them all out of here, and they went to the new Upper East Side of New York. Where? 57th Street. OK. okay. Now, isn't it amazing how much of this ladies' mile is still left? Right across the street is the Gallette Building by McKim, Mead, and White. Most of that block is still here today. 
Oh, this is one of the great Trump windows. Actually, this was on Sixth Avenue, Simpson Crawford. It was like the Bond would teller of its day. Now, this is up at Madison Square, where we're going to be in a few minutes. Uh, that's probably the Fifth Avenue Hotel uh, there on the right side of the ladies. And then this shot, look at that. This city was fabulous if you had money. And not everybody had money. Obviously. We've walked four more blocks uptown and yet another square. Madison Square. This was just like Union Square before the Civil War. Wealthy people lived around it, quiet, elegant, but not for long. By the 1880s, this is the theater district with hotels, theaters, nightclubs, Delmonico's. At the northeast corner of the square, Madison Square Garden opened up in 1890. Oh, this was class. This is why in this square they put the statue of William Seward. Now, nobody today knows who Seward was, but he was governor of New York, senator from New York, and then he became secretary of state under both Lincoln and Johnson. And as such, this is the guy who bought us Alaska. They thought he was crazy. What is wrong with this statue? Well, David, if you ever look at a photograph of Seward, he was about this high and dumpy. But if you look at this statue, that's a long, slender body, even though it's seated. Well, apparently Rogers, the sculptor, I don't know, he had money trouble or whatever. And he had done Seward's head, didn't have money to finish it, so he grabbed an extra body from his atelier. Now, if you look at that, everybody, we immediately recognize that's Abraham Lincoln's body. So that means you've got Seward's head on Lincoln's body here in Madison Square. We're looking north from here in Madison Square. I mean, we're standing right between Broadway and Fifth Avenue. And isn't it amazing you can still see the city of the 1870s when church spires were the skyline of New York, not skyscrapers. And then off to the right is the arm of the Statue of Liberty. What was it doing there? Well, it was on its way to the Philadelphia Centennial, so we know this has got to be about 1876, and you actually could walk up onto the observation platform around the flame. Not a bad way to see New York, Th huh? That's right. Well, now look, David, if we turn around here, this is one of the signature buildings of New York. It's the Flatiron Building. Now, why is, why is it so significant? Well. It was not the tallest, that's for sure, and it wasn't the first. It went up in 1902, so it's not the first skyscraper, but it's the site. You know what they say in real estate? Location, location, location. Well, it's where it was. People fell in love with it. Photographers fell in love with it. Uh, Stieglitz, Steichen, they all took photographs of it. So what did the shape of this do to this whole area? Well, it was so dramatic because of this plow-type shape and the silhouette against the sky that it really made New Yorkers feel this was the 20th century. Now, it had the same problem that our glass boxes did in the 1960s. The moment the wind hit the top of the building, like a waterfall, it came right down, hitting anything on the sidewalk, meaning you and me. People were blown off their feet, shop windows were shattered. And when the ladies used to line up, remember, it was the ladies' mile, when they used to line up for the streetcars, their skirts would fly up Marilyn Monroe style. Now, that term 23 skidoo, is that accurate? Absolutely, because the cops, you see, the guys used to hang out to get a gander of an ankle, you know, forbidden territory in 1902. And so the cops would come by and they'd tell these guys, hey, you on 23rd Street, move, skidoo, scam out of here. up a few more blocks and here we are in another square well this is what we americans call a square but uh, herald square i think is more like free choice and three dimensions which sounds a lot better than it looks well today everybody knows herald square it's the premier middle class shopping district in new york but it wasn't always that way here take a look at these photos here we are it's the 1890s it's got to be after 1893 because there's the herald building now james gordon bennett who ran the herald it used to be down at Park Row, where all the newspapers were. Remember when by we were City Hall, yeah. Absolutely, down owned by City Hall. Well, he had the brain, he had the brainstorm to break away from Park Row, move up to this part of town, which in the 1890s, this was the theater district. And he had the city rename this important theater square, Herald Square. But things changed so fast. Now, in this picture, we're looking uptown towards what was then Longacre Square. It's going to be Times Square in a few years. To the right, the 6th Avenue L opened up in 1878, came rattling along here right through the 1930s. 
Now, look at this, 10 years and already everything's changed. We look uptown and we can see the brand new Times Tower has just yep. gone up. Macy's, brand new, overlooking Herald Square. And that Macy's building, by the way, look at this. People, people never realize it. This corner at Broadway and 34th Street, when Macy's bought this lot, and after all, it was and probably still is one of the world's largest department stores, a competitor bought the corner lot, hoping to do a deal with Macy's. Well, Macy's would have none of it. So they built the building with a notch to go around the holdout. And in this holdout, it's a Cuban cigar store. When I was a kid, it was a Neenix. And an orange. Oh, Frankfurters and an orange drink. I can just taste the orange drink today. Now, this is a great shot of the old New York Herald building. It stood right here at the north end of the square. This is why preservationists fight the battles they do. When it went up in 1893, it gave such a panache to this square. And it stood until the mid-1920s. And if it was still here today, it would still give this square a unique sense of character. And back in 1883, just a few blocks north of Herald Square, they built the Metropolitan Opera House. How much sense did it make to build the Met here when they built it? Well, actually, this was Alaska as far as the theater was concerned. Most of the theaters were down at uh, Madison Square. But there was a reason it went up here. It was only a few blocks from the mansions on Fifth Avenue. Because you see, now here's the old Met. This building was built by millionaires for millionaires. And it had to be near where they lived it was a million miles from the poverty of the Lower East Side. The outside of it looked like a brewery, but the inside, mm, you needed sunglasses when you went in this place. How much did old money, new money have to do with the building? You see those boxes? That's what the new Met was all about. The old opera house on 14th Street was built by the pre-Civil War rich, and it just had 18 boxes just for them. Now we have Goulds, Rockefellers, Morgans, and they want opera boxes. They broke away from 14th Street. They built their opera house up here. When built, it was in the middle of nowhere. 20 years later, in the middle of the theater district, and by the 1920s, it was hopelessly downtown, and they were already looking to move it. And big. Next to La Scala was the biggest opera That's house right. in, the, in the world. Oh, I, I remember it. I used to be in standing room in the back. You know, when this came down, when they moved up to Lincoln Center, there was a bitter fight over keeping this building. But the Metropolitan Opera wanted it down. Down it came in 67. And look what we have now. The 1960s. What else? On an absolutely gorgeous, balmy night. We've made it up as far as Times Square. Give my regards to David, we are following the same route the theaters did in the 19th century. The last time we looked at this, we were at Union Square. Now we're up here at 42nd Street. The theaters did the same thing. Look, what a great picture. Top of the Times Tower. We're right down here right now. This was done about the 19 zeros. On the left, the Astor Hotel was right over there. Hammerstein's Olympia was over there from 1895. The theaters came up into Times Square. By the 1920s, a new phenomenon, the movie palace. Remember them? Oh, the Capitol, the DeMille, the Roxy, probably the most famous of them all, the Paramount. This is it when it was brand new. You could see that globe from miles away. You know, they just relit it along with the clock. Now, there's the original marquee the day it opened in 1926. You came down through the marquee into this lobby. Oh, are we Louis XIV or what? And then you went into this incredible movie palace auditorium. This brings back so many memories for me because I went here to hear the big bands many, many times when I was a kid. Oh, they must have had everybody, the Dorsey brothers, Frank Sinatra. When did you first go to hear Sinatra at the Paramount? I was, uh, I believe, 1942. Describe what it was like to come to this place and go in that theater and hear Sinatra. It was crazy. I mean, got on a line on 43rd Street, went around the corner. Of course, they were all screaming, and I had heard about the screaming, but I was new to it. He walked out on stage, and here's a skinny, you know how skinny he was with the big bow tie. He's screaming at that. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, he started to sing night and day. I found myself screaming. It was just happy years. I mean, we went through a war, we went through uh, depression, we went through everything. But 
always had my Frank Sinatra to listen to, and it was wonderful. We have barely slid our way out of Times Square up to 49th Street and Broadway. We're in front of the Brill Building, 1929-30. This was the building that was identified with Tin Pan Alley. Now, what is Tin Pan Alley? Tin Pan Alley was the beginning of American popular music, which really we Americans invented. It's kind of we're on the way to Frank Sinatra and rock and roll. Now, where was Tin Pan Alley, though, when it was well, created or you remember made? When, when we were back in Madison Square, right. and that was the theater district in the 1880s and 90s. Well, in the 90s is when Tin Pan Alley really was born, the music industry. And in those days, it was right along 28th Street, between Broadway and uh, 6th Avenue. And one of the reasons why they call these music producing areas Tin Pan Alley, can you imagine walking along the street, all the windows open during the summer, and all of these guys tinkling on the piano, hoping they're going to have next year's mega hit? Well, as the theater district moved uptown, the songwriters moved up with it. And by the 1930s, this area of Broadway and the side streets, this was the Tin Pan Alley area. But everybody really identifies the Brill Building with Tin Pan Alley. Compared to everything else we've seen on Broadway, especially Times Square, just a few blocks below us, Columbus Circle seems like it what, just never really made it? How accurate is that? Uh, I think that's a kind remark for Columbus Circle. I would call this the orphan of Broadway. Now, David, we've been coming up Broadway. We've seen every 20 years the theater district, the shopping district moved uptown another 20 blocks. That's why in the 1900s, when Times Square was filling up with theaters, they were sure in 20 years the theaters would be here. They were wrong. Here's a photograph of Columbus Circle right after Gitano Russo's memorial went up in the 1890s. There's Broadway going up to the Upper West Side. Central Park is right over here. We're at the southwest corner, Central Park West. Look at it. It's basically a traffic interchange for trolleys. So here we are, and this place is still in the middle of nowhere and dark. Oh, give me that light. Here. Oh, finally, the only thing lighting up Christopher tonight is the moon and me. How do you get to Lincoln Center? How? Practice. I thought that was uh, Carnegie Hall. Yeah, yeah. All right, Lincoln Center here, 1516 acres of it. How, why here? Well, today, people call this the Upper West Side, and it is. But back in the 19th and early 20th century, actually, the respectable middle-class townhouse Upper West Side didn't start till 70th Street. This was really an extension of Hell's Kitchen. And it was a pretty tough area. Now, below us was San Juan Hill. That was the African-American district at that time. Here, this was Italian and Irish. And by the 1950s, it was uh, Latino. Well, the city wanted urban renewal, and they brought in Lincoln Center. But did you ever see the movie West Side Story? Sure. Well, the outdoor shots of that movie were shot here in the streets of the deserted tenements. And in the background, I mean, next time you see it, just watch, you can see the boarded up houses. Perfect setting for West Side Story. The day after the film was finished, in came the demolition crew, and today we have Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center, what does it reflect? What does it mean, or should it mean to all of us? Well, it's really the center for much of the entertainment that goes on in New York City and indeed much of the United States as well. We have four theaters right here at Lincoln Center, Avery Fisher Hall, which is home to the New York Philharmonic, Metropolitan Opera, of course, New York State Theater. It's the center for a lot of the musical and uh, theatrical entertainment in our city. Fresh air. Oh, it's the Upper West Side. This fresh air, this used to be the country in the Civil War. This was rural upstate New York. Well, look at this. Now, we have started down there. We were at 42nd Street, Columbus Circle. Now we're at West 72nd Street. The city knows urban development is coming. They lay out this thing called the Boulevard. It went from 59th Street to 155th Street, basically followed the Bloomingdale Road. Beautiful divided roadway, planted median, beautiful trees along the sidewalk. Oh, they thought the richest people would live along the Boulevard. Oh, what a flop, worse than anything that ever played Broadway. Well, 
they didn't know what to do. They were, they, they were at their wit's end. And then in 1899, the city announced mana from heaven. Subway. The IRT. The city was going to build New York's first electric railroad underground subway with local and express stops linking downtown where all the middle class worked with uptown, the Upper West Side in Harlem, where the middle class lived 20 minutes to Wall Street. Oh, the old L trains took you an hour. Now look, this guy is standing here in the middle of Broadway. He looks like he might as well be in the middle of Westchester. But even though it's 1899, 1900, the future is about to break. There is the steel framing of the Ansonia already going up. The subway started construction that year, barreling up Broadway and turning this dismal failure called the Boulevard into a fabulous success called Broadway. And it also brought to this neighborhood something that middle-class New Yorkers were a little leery about and frankly didn't like at all. It was called the apartment house. 1904, between 73rd and 74th Street, the Ansonia opens. Why was it such a big deal? A big deal? Look at the size of this thing. Here it is in a, in a picture when it was brand new, looming above Broadway, flamboyant in that Parisian style. The developer thought it was like a Paris apartment house, <laughs> except in Paris in 1904, at 17 stories, it would have looked like Godzilla in a seven-story city like Paris. So who lived here? Well, they had everyone. It, it, the middle class, you know, they, they didn't like these places. They thought that these apartment houses were basically high-rise bordellos, being Anglo-Saxon. They thought apartment houses were louche, the kind of place the French would live in. But by 1900, the middle class had to move into apartment houses, so the developers ran them as hotels. And what services you had. Look at these magnificent lobbies, beautiful staircases, two-story high dining room. Every night you could eat here with your family, or if you didn't want to eat in this dining room, you could have room service, bring it upstairs to your apartment, heat it up in your kitchen, and serve it in your own dining room. Now, that's the Ansonia, but there were a lot of other buildings oh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. They began to line Broadway in the zeros and tens. The Apthorpe up the street in 79th Street, which is also one of the great apartment houses here on the Upper West Side. Beautiful main entrance from Broadway. Uh, exquisite courtyard. That building had built-in refrigerators that were cooled by coils of ice brine running through the walls. And of course, here at the Ansonia, it was like a who's who from entertainment. Stravinsky lived here, Rachmaninoff, Arturo Toscanini, uh, Theodore Dreiser, the writer, Babe Ruth, the great baseball player. In fact, he started playing the saxophone, said that he was inspired, apparently, by being surrounded by all these music people. Well, I think Babe Ruth was inspired by more than the saxophone. Apparently, his apartment was a revolving door for young ladies. And Flo Ziegfeld, you know, he had his wife in one apartment and his mistress in another. Swimming pool. Oh, absolutely. This place had a luxurious Turkish bath with one of the world's largest indoor pools. By the 1970s, it was the gay bathhouse, the Continental Baths, where Bette Midler had her debut. Well, what a magnificent building today. Well, by the 1910s, the middle class were ensconced in these grand Upper West Side apartment houses, and it became the bastion of New York's bourgeoisie. What a fabulous interior space for a bank. Isn't it an amazing generation? I mean, they believe mundane activities should be done in the most magnificent settings. Remember the rotunda at the Custom House? Remember the ticket hall at the Cunard Building? Here we are in a bank. Central Savings Bank started out in the Ladies' Mile, but when their middle-class clientele moved up here to the Upper West Side, they followed them and opened this bank in 1928 as their main headquarters. York and Sawyer did a beautiful job. Italian Renaissance Palazzo on the outside, magnificent arcaded Renaissance interior. Look at that vaulted roof with all of its coppers, and here, the floor with these magnificent marbled inlaid patterns. <laughs> And that ironwork, oh, that is spectacular. That is Samuel Yellen of Philadelphia. We saw his ironwork when we were down in the Cunard building downtown. It 
it's amazing. Here we are at the confluence of Broadway and West End Avenue here up at 105th Street. And as noisy as all the traffic is passing by, when you're in this square, I always think, oh, you feel like you're a million miles away from all the hubbub of New York City. This used to be called Bloomingdale Square. It was named after this huge area. The Dutch called it Bloomingdale in the 17th century. The square is now called Strauss Memorial Square after Isadora Nida Strauss, who lived right around the corner on West End Avenue in one of the last old country houses left over from rural Bloomingdale. Now, Isidore Strauss, he and his brothers were from Bavaria. They came to the United States, rags to riches. By the 1890s, Isidore and his brothers owned R.H. Macy. He was a well-respected man, a philanthropist. He and his wife went to Europe in 1912. And when they came back, they decided to go on the Titanic. Well, that night when the ship was sinking, and only women and children were allowed in the boats, they offered Mr. Strauss a seat. He was, after all, an elderly man. But he refused to go, and his wife, she had spent so many years with him, she would not get in the boat. And survivors say that the last they saw of the Strausses, they were sitting on the deck chairs as the boat went down, holding hands. Broadway's right over here. This is 116th Street in front of Barry and me. Of course, there are no cars on it here because this is Columbia University. How long has Columbia been in this part of town? Just over a century before they were here. In the middle of the 19th century, they were on a cramped little campus down at Madison Avenue and 49th Street. They couldn't take it anymore. They decided to jump way north to the edge of the city to what then was called Harlem Heights. But when Columbia moved here in the early 1890s, they renamed it Morningside Heights. They got Charles McKim, now this is Stanford White's partner, to create for them what is probably one of the finest urban campuses in the United States. Oh, Charles McKim was a brilliant architect. Now, you realize Columbia thought in back of their mind that even though they'd have this wonderful isolated acropolis, back in the 1890s, since Midtown Manhattan had moved north 20 blocks every 20 years, they assumed by the 1920s, Midtown could very well be at 125th Street in Harlem. <laughs> they weren't right about that one. Hundred Twenty Fifth Street, we've made it this far north, but what are we doing up in the air? It's not that the subway has come out of the ground, it's that the ground has fallen below us. We are on top of a valley, an ancient valley. When the subway was built, they had to bridge this valley that 125th Street now runs through. You know, everybody thinks it's only the Upper West Side that was affected by the subway. But when it opened up in 1904, all the land to the north of us, Hamilton Heights, Washington Heights, Inwood, was covered within 15, 20 years with dense apartment houses. In fact, they called it the subway boom. And William Barclay Parsons, who was the brilliant engineer of our IRT subway, when he came to this valley, he bridged it with this magnificent iron viaduct. And this is part of the original 1904 construction. If you look at the detail, beautiful construction, magnificent arches supporting this. If you know what this structure looks like, you see it all over the place in commercials, still photography, films. This viaduct is one of New York's celebrities. Church of the Intercession, 155th and Broadway, but back in 1776, George Washington and his troops were right here. General Howe and the Brits had taken over Lower Manhattan, and this is where Washington prepared to move north to retreat up to White Plains. But that was well over 200 years ago. Well, after he left, a few of the families moved in. You know, in the 18th and early 19th century, this was like Litchfield County, Connecticut. This was where your, your weekend homes, your summer estate was, and it took you an hour and a half or two hours to get here. The same thing as to Litchfield, Connecticut today. It was, now, here was where the Carmen family was, this part. Uh, next door to the north was the Audubon family. Way up at the tip of Manhattan was the Dykeman estate. Now, Trinity. We saw Trinity Church. Church. Down the, yeah, absolutely. Oh. They, they ran out of room in that cemetery down there. So in the 1840s, they bought part of the Carmen estate, 
laid out this beautiful cemetery, which is really what gives us an idea of what this rural part of Manhattan looked like. Now, on the other side, in that part of the cemetery, that's where Clement Clark Moore is buried. It was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care. And do you want me to go on? Well, you got a present for me? That's coming. Just... And it was in the 1820s he did that poem. Isn't it amazing? All that academic work, and that's all we know him for. Now, on this side of Broadway, in fact, right through that gate, right in back of this church, is the grave of John James Audubon. He actually was French Haitian, but we know him as the American naturalist who did those beautiful prints of birds. And it was his estate just to the north. Part of it, at least, was bought in the 19 zeros by the Huntington family, and right over there, is where Archer Huntington created an acropolis for northern Manhattan, Audubon Terrace, and the Hispanic Society. Inside this Hispanic Society, they have some incredible collection. You know, like most New Yorkers, I haven't been here in 20 years. In fact, most New Yorkers don't even know this place exists. How many people do you think come here? Well, it shows you, David, location is everything. Here they get 50,000 people a year. In the Metropolitan Museum, they get three and a half million visitors. And, and we're in a skylit room that's in the center of the Hispanic Society. This is a Joaquin Soraya painting. 195 linear feet of painting surround us all of the peoples of Spain, from all the regions with their native costume, doing their local activities. It's an amazing piece of work. I just glanced at paintings, Goya, El Greco, Velasquez. I mean, there are a lot of fabulous paintings. This is really one of the hidden treasures of New York. is a member of the City Council of the City of New York and joins us now. Mr. Councilman, nice to have you with us. It's a pleasure. Where are we? What is your constituency? This is the heart of Washington Heights in northern Manhattan, the northernmost tip of the island. And uh, this is my constituency, which is as diverse as New York City can get. How are you? How significant is it that you are an elected member of the City Council of New York? Well, being the first uh, Dominican-born elected official in the City Council and the first in the country to be elected to higher office uh, carries so much pride. The pride that every single immigrant group that came to this United States had whenever a first was elected. It carries a lot of responsibility and it introduces the group to the rest of the city and the country. My neighborhood is very condensed, highly populated, very attractive to, to people and for business, and it covers as far down Washington Heights as uh, Columbia University, Presbyterian Hospital, Yeshiva, and many other uh, major institutions, but you have Broadway cutting through Washington Heights. So Broadway is really embracing all of Manhattan, but in Northern Manhattan in a very special way. Broadway and 165th Street now, it's the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. But this is where the Yankees began, our New York Yankees. They were known as the Highlanders back in 1903. And this photograph shows you the park they played in. We're standing on the same corner the photographer was. We're looking across the street. I know it says American League Park, but they called it Hilltop Park. And we are certainly on top of a hill here in Washington Heights. 
They played here until 1912 when they moved to the Polo Grounds with the Giants. That year, William Fox built the Audubon Ballroom and Movie Complex, the facade of which is still standing. Now, this is the building in which Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965. Today, we only have the facade, but that facade is a memorial to Malcolm X. We're here in the garden of the Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and this is where Home Plate was located when this entire property was Hilltop Park, and this is where the Highlanders made their home, the guys we call the Yankees today. There they are, up at bat, Broadway in the background. And advertising is not new to outfield. It's part of the American scene as much as baseball is. Now here's a close-up, and you notice the grandstands are packed held 16,000 people. They say it was packed most of the time. We were a baseball town. And here's Chet Hoff. Now, this guy played for the Yankees three seasons back then in the 1910s. He lived to the age of 107. When he was 103, they brought him here to dedicate this plaque. I don't think I could go nine innings right now, but I think I could go seven innings. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. memories for me, not this house, but theaters like it. This is my childhood. I grew up in theaters like this. Isn't it amazing, David? We truly are a disposable culture. We built these magnificent movie palaces in one generation. By the next generation, we were throwing them away, literally. And we have so few of these left. This was built as the Lowy's, 175th Street. Lowe's, 175th Street. David, please, you're from across the river. We can hear that. This was opened in 1930. These movie palaces really began in the 1910s. The Audubon Ballroom was 1912. But when talkies came in, in the late 1920s, then these movie palaces really hit their heyday. The Paramount opened on Times Square. And a couple of years later, in 1930, there's the theater we're in now. Isn't that an amazing place? What do you call this architecturally? Well, I'd call it um, Mayan, Aztec, Uzbekistani deco. I, I think it's that category. Now, this is an ad from opening day. You, you have to explain to the younger people, when you paid for a movie, it wasn't just a movie. You saw the newsreel, you saw the cartoon, and you had a stage show. We had stage shows between the movies, so you got everything. Now, this theater, look at this amazing fantasy land that they created back in 1930. It's hard to believe that anybody would design and build this today. You well, Thomas Lamb did this, and he was an incredible architect. Now, this theater only lasted 37 years. And it closed in 1967. But in 1969, the Reverend Ike bought this for his United Church. And he did a remarkable job of cleaning and restoring the place. It's been 20 years since I've been here. And I must say, with all the thousands of people who have come through here, and they don't just have uh, religious services, they rent it out for concerts and public events. So they've had thousands of people come through here. It is not cheap to maintain these older places, and yet it still looks so spectacular, like the day it opened. Right. As a matter of fact, this theater still has, down there is the original organ, excellent shape. I'd love to hear it on a Sunday morning. And upstairs in the projection room, they still have the original projectors. How old were these machines? When were they used? Probably 35, 1935, 1940. And they would have been used till, till about when? Probably the 60s, late 60s. When did your grandfather start? 1913, 1915, somewhere in there. But there was no sound then? No, no. He worked with a piano player. He had to crank it, and uh, he worked with a piano player. And the piano player, sometimes you had to... They'd be out of time because the, the piano players changed twice a day. And my grandfather would be cranking all day by himself, and he'd get a little slow, and the new piano player would be going quicker. So my dad often, my dad would often come in at night after school or at night, bring my grandfather's dinner, 
and he would crank the rest of the night for my grandfather. That's how my dad learned it, the craft. So then you learned the craft from your dad? Yes. Yeah. I used to follow my dad into the projection booth, especially during the summers off from school. I was always amazed by it, you know, all the mechanics of it. And uh, my dad was a good teacher. Will this thing still run? We could give it a shot. You better stand back. Okay. It's been a long time. This is one of the gems of New York. It's the Metropolitan Museum's medieval collection, and it sits in Port Tryon Park, 260 feet above sea level. We overlook the neighborhood of Inwood, the last neighborhood in Manhattan. It's a world unto itself. It reminds me very much of those neighborhoods in Berlin and Vienna that are pushed up against these wooded hills, and these beautiful lakes. Well, we are in our New York's Wienerwald. Fort Tryon Park, an old estate that the Rockefellers bought, and then by 1930, they turned it into a public park. And then, in the 30s, the Rockefellers paid for the building of the cloisters, which is actually a new building, but it incorporates many different architectural elements from the medieval period, the Romanesque and Gothic period, monasteries, cloisters, chapter houses. We're in a chapter house from the 12th century. It's basically a Romanesque uh, structure, but it does have a Gothic ceiling. Beautifully done and, and, and beautifully reconstructed. Now, the Rockefellers not only gave to us, New Yorkers, for Try and Park, the cloisters, but they also bought across the Hudson River. That entire stretch of the Palisades was bought by the Rockefellers to give us the, the sense that when we looked across this river, there would never be new construction, there would never be new development. And as we scan the Palisades, we can feel like we are in the 17th century. A hint of Rome, a very small hint. But it looks just like Italia, great rooms used for all kinds of mundane purposes. This is what it looked like originally. This was an entrance gate to a hilltop estate. This is the Siemens family, Valentin Siemens, built this in the 1850s. His house and the gate were made out of the same marble which they found on the property. This is the same marble they used in Grace Church downtown when we were all the way down the road. Oh, and what a road we have traveled. Look at this. We started out in Bowling Green, Union Square, Times Square, the Upper West Side, Columbia University, Washington Heights, and we are now, there we are at the Harlem River. Almost there, Barry. Almost. Thank you, sir. Oh, this has been a pleasure. No, it's been mine. Thank you. That's a little bit of Broadway, some 17 miles of it, the Manhattan part. Uh, this is the Harlem River, where Broadway crosses into the Bronx and then heads north. A uh, special thanks to all of our guests. For Barry Lewis and all of us, I'm David Hartman. Uh, good having you with us. Make it a good evening. Thank you.